Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God, what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Got a Bible or a device in front of you? That's where we are um, this morning. We've been in this series, uh, Romans, uh, the best news ever. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, we call it Romans because it's a letter uh, that was written to a church in Rome. So that's where they were. Let's uh, pray together as we begin. Father in heaven, we do pray for those children that they would grow to a spiritual adult maturity in Jesus that in a sense they would become like us but father more so we pray that we would become like them not innocent we're not neither are they but father dependent and aware of our dependence and our great need as your children help us to come to you and to come to your word and to come to life and our work and our responsibilities as adults with great humility and help us now to humbly hear your word father we're conscious as we celebrate pentecost that the church needs the holy spirit and we pray father that your spirit would be at work in us today we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When in Rome. It's a phrase, isn't it, that we use. When in Rome, uh, do as the Romans do. Um, if you, uh, I don't know, let's say you bumped into me at Felix, though, at the beach, right? And I had an absolutely massive ice cream, you know, the proper ones with all the bits coming like, what about that big? Massive, great big thing. And you saw me, and there was a bit of cheeky banter about it. I might uh, come back at you and say, when in Rome? 
right? Just, I'm here, we're at Felix Stowe, I've got an ice cream, that's what you do when in Rome, do as the Romans uh, do. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, to that, Paul has said so far in Romans chapter 12, no, no. <laughs> No, an emphatic no, actually, no. When in Rome, Christians, don't do as the Romans do. Uh, Paul has spelled out, hasn't he, beginning of chapter 12, uh, this idea that we're to live this absolutely radical, transformed life uh, as Christians. Be transformed, he said, didn't he? 12 verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to the pattern of of this world anymore. So so Christians are called to this absolutely countercultural way of living. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, Paul says no do the very opposite. We saw that a few weeks ago, didn't we? We thought about, uh, we zeroed in, narrowed in on the subject of honour and actually we found that Christians, when it comes to honour, are to do the exact opposite. The Roman culture was all about getting honour and we learned that we're to to give honour, we're to be in almost a competition to be the first to honour somebody else so we're to be the exact opposite of the culture around us to be distinctive uh, as Paul has drawn this out to be different Uh, but also uh, what we saw last week is the Christian community in Rome they weren't just to be different and distinctive Uh, they were delightful really or at least that's what they were called to be to be this this loving community Uh, if they were following what Paul was telling them to do they would have been a wonderful place to be uh, in that community of Christians uh, in Rome it was a community of love it had a family feel but they're in Rome they're surrounded by uh, they live amongst they work with Romans and they are ruled they are governed by Romans too. So how does that work? How's that going to work for them? Jesus is their great king and they're called to live totally differently for him and yet they do live in Rome in this world. How does that work? What do you do? Do you sort of how do you maintain that community of love and that 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 difference and distinctness while living in Rome? Do you sort of circle the wagons and batten down the hatches? What what do you do? It's the old tension and we all live there. Uh, the basic tension uh, uh, one of them of the Christian life uh, is this, isn't it? Is that we are the redeemed people of this is a, a basic storyline of the Bible, the four basic building blocks of the Bible story. Creation, full redemption, new creation. We're the redeemed And we know that we're going to the new creation, but we live in this fallen, broken creation and world. So how does that work? How do we how do we wrestle with that and and live that? Well, that's what Paul's talking about here. And that's what we're going to explore um, this morning uh, through two things. And the first um, will be uh, the longest. The first thing Paul says is give what you owe. And first of all, he says, give what you owe to God government he talks doesn't he about uh, the governing uh, authorities in chapter 13 let's have a look and just understand what he's saying about these civil secular authorities uh, in chapter 13 and we'll we'll kind of understand how that applies to us so verse 1 Paul says let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established the authorities that exist have been established by God. Now that word established, or it can be understood appointed, is very strong. God has established, he has appointed those who govern us. The same word is used in Acts chapter 13 where we're told some people heard the gospel, they heard about Jesus, and we're told those who were appointed to eternal life believed. So there's a, there's a chosenness, there's an appointing, there's a, an establishing about how God sets up uh, civil, secular authorities. Then verse 2, uh, we're told, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. 
Now again, that word instituted, it's only used one other time uh, in the Bible. In, in the New Testament, in Acts 7, it's used to describe how God instituted his Old Testament laws. God instituted his laws, and now we're told he has instituted secular authorities uh, above us. Um, someone has, uh, has said of this passage is absolutely right great observation the most prominent and repeated word what is it it's God God is the most prominent and repeated word in in this passage God 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 he says God is not indifferent or absent from the sphere of politics government and authority uh, and Paul's uh, just building here off of the Old Testament. So this is what uh, we told in Daniel 4.17. The Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. He is the ruler of kings. He's the king of kings. And he places kings and, and rulers in authority. He puts them wherever he chooses and pleases. He establishes them. They're established by God. What else do we learn about them? Well, the rest of verse 2, uh, though, who, who rebel against them end of verse 2 uh, those who do that will, will bring judgment on themselves that could mean God's judgment on them or it could mean the ruler's judgment on them I think it probably means um, the latter but what else do we learn uh, about these governing authorities verse 3 for rulers hold no terror th for those who do right but for those who do wrong do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority then do what is right you'll be commended we'll come back to that later verse 4 for the one in authority is God's servant for your good and then he repeats that again doesn't he he's God's servant for uh, your good uh, but if you do wrong be afraid for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason they are God's servants and also agents of, of wrath uh, he, Paul says that the, the governing authorities, whoever's in charge, they are God's servants. The word is diakonos, from which we get our deacons, right? Uh, and so they're, they're, they're God's deacons. The, the prime minister or the king or, or whoever it is, they're, they're God's deacons, God's servants. Uh, and indeed agents or an avenger of uh, wrath it says as well so uh, last week we learned that we're to uh, hand over we don't uh, repay evil for evil uh, we don't uh, sort of carry out vengeance we hand over that to God and to his judgment and indeed to his wrath now part of the answer of that is that God has instituted governing authorities uh, and they make a judgment about right and wrong and they punish what is wrong and commend what is good. Part of handing over to God is that then he has handed some responsibility over them. That's part of uh, what's going on there back from the previous chapter. Uh, but what else do we learn about these governing authorities? Let's skip to verse uh, 6. Uh, it goes on to talk about paying taxes. I, I know, I know, we'll come to that in a minute. But this is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are, and there he goes again, God's servants. Now the word is different there. It's a different Greek word. It's the word leitergoi, from which we get liturgy. Uh, and what it means is a, a servant or minister. It's used of the Old Testament temple and the priests. It's used of, in the New Testament of gospel ministry. In other words, Paul is saying that these rulers, they're God's servants and they're God's ministers, almost with like a, a religious uh, connotation. Uh, God puts great weight and authority on these people and so we are to submit to Rishi Sunak. He has been established by God as a governing authority. When she was in power, Liz Truss was established by God, instituted by God, uh, and Boris Johnson, uh, and Theresa May, and David Cameron, and Gordon Brown, and Tony Blair, and John Major, and Margaret Thatcher, and James Calgary, and on and on we go. How do I know that they were established? But how do I know that they were, you know, God's authority, God's servants? Because because they were, because they were in charge, and that's God instituted them, God established them, and put them over us, and indeed others beneath them who were also uh, above us in terms of authority. As someone uh, has said, government is more than a nuisance to be put up with. It is an institution established by God to accomplish some of his purposes 
on earth. Now, the history of uh, understanding this passage, the history of interpretation of this passage, uh, always goes into, well, what about when? You know, what about this kind of government and what about that and what about this situation and, uh, and we kind of end up there, the, the academics do that and, and we do that as well as we look at the passage, don't we? But actually before we get there, before we get to any sort of what about this situation and, and what about that and there are some of those for sure, before we get there, the baseline of Romans 13, 1 to 7 is submit to them. That is what we're called to do, submit. It's as a Christian to have a posture of submission, which more often than not will literally mean we are to obey them. God has instituted them as his servants over us. And uh, uh, Jesus taught this, didn't he, of course? uh, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God uh, what is God's. It's not an isolated teaching of the New Testament. Uh, 1 Peter, uh, Peter uh, teaches something very uh, similar. So he says in chapter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent Uh, by him Uh, and then later on show proper respect to everyone love the family of believers fear God honor the emperor Uh, Paul um, elsewhere uh, tells the Christian leader uh, Titus remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient in other words it is my responsibility to remind us that this is what we ought to be doing Uh, and of course uh, elsewhere um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 we're called to pray for them as well and they need our prayers we need to pray for those in authority uh, and we do so often don't we on a Sunday publicly and, and elsewhere as well uh, we, we live um, there don't we we are the redeemed people of God we're going to the new creation but we still live there and there God has set up authority structures and leaders and put them over us and sometimes there will be laws that we don't like but we have to obey why Uh, he goes on to explain uh, a little bit doesn't he in verse 5 the reasoning uh, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment but also as a matter of conscience. So obviously, you might submit to them because you don't want to get in trouble, right? That's fair cop, isn't it? Um, you know, I guess a child on the playground might think, well, I better play the toe the line, otherwise I'm going to get in trouble here. But, so there's that reason, but there's also the reason of conscience as well. It is a matter of conscience. What does that mean? Well, uh, as a Christian, I have a conscience, and my conscience reminds me that there is a creator There is a God in heaven who has made all things and the way that he's created things is that he's put these authority structures in place. My conscience reminds me of that. It calls me back to that truth about God and his world where we live right here. And let me say, if you flagrantly disobey the governing authorities, then you bruise and batter and bludgeon your conscience and that's not good for you as a Christian it it damages you so we mustn't do that and then Paul explains it a different way he goes to verse 6 he says this is also why you pay uh, taxes oh here we go that ultimate statistic of paying taxes but uh, actually Paul's not particularly commanding the Romans to pay their taxes here Jesus does that and of course he, he knows that here he's saying look The fact that you pay your taxes is, as someone has put it, it's an implicit recognition that these people are over you, that they are the governing authorities. You sort of see how that works. So you are paying your taxes, and as you're doing that, your conscience is reminding you that you ought to obey, and your actual paying of your taxes reminds you, it's a reminder that they are in authority over you, and you must uh, obey them. Uh, It's interesting that the language here that Paul uses about taxes is literally to give back what you owe. Give back. And that apes the language of Jesus when he says, give back, literally give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. So uh, give uh, what you owe to 
government. That's part of how we live when we're in Rome or as we are at mid-Suffolk. Um, there's a little bit more uh, to it than that, isn't there? Um, at some point uh, when I was younger, I learned to read. Um, I know it's amazing, isn't it, considering where I came from, but at some point I, I did learn to read, and there were a few of us up there that could read, so that was quite useful, really. And uh, I learned to read, and uh, it's my boy's eighth birthday today, and I guess at around that sort of age I got really into, so this is Biggles, right? So Biggles adventures and kind of, you know, shooting people and stuff or whatever. But I, I, I got into Biggles and I just read, this is, this is a novel, this isn't true history, but I just read loads of these. And then um, uh, from uh, Biggles, I kind of moved on into the Second World War and soldiers and battles and all of this sort of stuff. And then from that, I moved into the, the prisoners of war and the great escape, you know, Colditz and all that, you know, how they escaped out of the prison camps and the people that helped them the French resistance or whoever they were who smuggled them across the Pyrenees and they got home and all, all this sort of boyhood reading, you know, these kind of stories that I enjoyed. Uh, and of course, the, the, the people in those occupied countries helped them. And also, there were people under the, the Nazi regime in their country who disobeyed the Nazi authorities, resisted uh, and helped people and smuggled people. We think of Corrie Ten, you know, all these stories that we, we share, don't we? They, they resisted the governing authorities that were over them. That's all very exciting as a boy, isn't it? It's, you know, the stories, it's, I, I just got completely lost in that world. But it does raise the obvious question, doesn't it? When is it right? And some of these people were Christians, sadly not as many as there might have been, but some of the Christians that resisted, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and other people like that. When is it right to disobey? What about when? What about when? Here's a couple of scenarios where we're called to disobey the authorities over us. One is the swap, isn't it? Uh, sometimes uh, governing authorities swap Good for bad and right for wrong. In many senses, that's what happened under that regime. And all of a sudden, uh, what's been commended is thoroughly evil. And what's been punished is all that is good and right and true. That's a moral swap, if you like. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it's a swap uh, because you're called to bow down and worship a false god rather than the one true living god. That's a gospel swap. Uh, sometimes uh, you might be told to stop speaking the gospel. That's what happened in, in Acts chapters 4 and 5, didn't it? The authorities literally said to the Christians, stop talking about Jesus. We'll let you go, but you stop talking about Jesus. And of course, they said to that, we must obey God. <laughs> rather than man we must obey God and at the end of Acts chapter 5 there's this lovely phrase they never stopped talking about Jesus there is a time to act uh, when you're called to stop spreading the gospel or when that gospel swap comes that we're called to bow down and worship you think of Daniel Daniel chapter 3 is called to bow down and worship someone who is not the God who made all things uh, and that's the time to disobey uh, that may also stretch to moral issues as well like uh, you read this passage don't you think hang on a minute what about the government that uh, doesn't commend what is good uh, and punishes what, is, what, what about the government that reverses? Well, I think there is a time and a place that uh, comes a point where we have to disobey. Uh, think of the Hebrew midwives in, in Exodus chapter 1 and those uh, brave brothers and sisters who defied uh, the Nazis in the Second World War. And you think of other examples besides. But even so, uh, even so, it is for us as Christians, first of all, to be informed and to be involved in, in government and in, in politics and to use our voice isn't it wonderful that we still have a voice that we have rights we have a voice we have a vote we have uh, opportunities to to shape things and to say things to use uh, our voice and I think it's right that we go to all of those places first <laughs> before we turn to civil disobedience Those are times to act. There is one thing to be aware of. This is the thing to be aware of. Government 
is not neutral. I hope you know that. <laughs> Government is not neutral. That everybody works from uh, ultimate commitments. So everyone has a worldview, don't they? And uh, for sure, the government is not neutral. There's a secular myth, isn't there? That sort of, well, you Christians, you know, you sort of keep your beliefs to the private, you know, private public thing. Uh, you keep them in, pr in private, but we'll look after the public sphere and the public square, and then it'll be all fair and equal and, and neutral, because we're neutral, right? We're secular, so we're, we're, we're neutral. And that is <laughs> absolute nonsense, isn't it? The government is not uh, neutral. This is uh, what someone said, uh, Trevor Phillips, the chairman of Equality and Human Rights Commission, back in 2012 said, Christians must choose between their religion and obeying the law, uh, they, to leave it at the temple door as he puts it. Religion uh, is for the private sphere uh, and government will look after the public sphere. That's wrong, isn't it? Actually, our Christian faith ought to go right into the public sphere. We have a public life uh, as Christians uh, that picture I gave earlier of the Roman Christians, maybe they're meant to sort of huddle and circle and batten down the hatches. No, uh, as Christians we have a public uh, life and a public uh, responsibility. C.S. Lewis said this, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So when in Rome... When in mid-Suffolk, we are to sieve and sift what's been said to us by everyone, of course, and by government, even as we submit and do as we're told. So what, give what you owe to government. Uh, we'll move more rapidly now. Um, but it, there is, uh, Paul then broadens it out, doesn't he? He says, okay, give what you owe to government, uh, and then he says, give what you owe to everyone, to all people. And he uses that language of owing, doesn't he? Verse 7, talking about paying taxes and so on, uh, uh, giving what you owe. And then verse 8, he picks up the language. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Someone has described it as the never-ending debt. Uh, we can never love too much. That's the teaching of the New Testament. That's Jesus, isn't it? We can never love too much. We're called to love uh, all people. Notice that Paul starts with the church. He says, doesn't he, that we're to love one another, verse 8. But then immediately, for whoever loves others, and there he's talking about everyone, we're to love all people. Uh, we've seen this before in this cha the previous chapter, haven't we? Actually, it starts in the church and then it spreads out. So we're to love one another and we're to love all people. Love your neighbor, uh, says Paul. Uh, he says, doesn't he, that the love fulfills the law, verse 8 uh, and verse 10. It's the fulfillment of the law. I think what that means is, you know, love guards us against a hard legalism that is all rules and all laws. And it also guards us against, if I can put it like this, a mushy liberalism which allows all things. I don't necessarily mean political liberalism there, but, but uh, the, the true love that Jesus prescribes, it guards us against a hard legalism that's all about laws, and it guards us against a mushy liberalism, which is like love allows everything and, and all things. And it cuts right through that. You see, the law isn't enough. You can't have enough laws to cover all of life, but love is. <laughs> love can cover all of life. And at the same time, love has a moral fiber a moral framework, a moral fabric to it. And that's why he, he cites all of those commandments, doesn't he? Uh, the commands to, to not commit adultery, to not murder, to not steal and so on. The love that's prescribed for us as Christians has got fiber and fabric, moral fiber to it. And so when in Rome and when in mid-Suffolk, we're not to batten down the hatches. We have a public life and a responsibility to submit, yeah, for sure, and to love all people. Okay, second thing, much more briefly, uh, as we close, Paul says, get out of bed. 
I don't know if you struggle with that. Some people are morning people, some people are night people, aren't they? Some of you are raising children and indeed teenagers. Uh, and maybe you find that, uh, you know, you need one of those every now and again. Just, uh, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you go all fashion, just get a pan like my dad would have done, you know, a pan and, a, you know, just wake or shout rouse. He used to shout rouse as rouse <laughs> to get us out of, out of bed. We're back to Nazi Germany, but there we go. Um, but it <laughs> whatever, it wo- whatever it works to get them out of bed. Um, uh, why do I say that? because that's where Paul goes as in he verse 11 he says do this understanding the present time the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber he's saying Christians wake up from your spiritual slumber and that's something we all need to hear from time to time isn't it wake up spiritually wake up And fascinating that at the beginning of chapters 12, when we began this section, what we were told is, look, here's what God's done for you in the past, the the mercies of God. Now live in the light of that. Be transformed. So we had that at the beginning of chapter 12. And now right over here at the end of chapter 13, Paul goes, now live in the light of what's coming of where God's taking you. Did you notice that? He says, talks about that day, doesn't he? Verse 12, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The day of the Lord Jesus. And so that has an implication for how I live today when in Rome. And he says, get out of bed. And he says, get dressed, doesn't he? Okay, you get out of bed. Maybe you have your brekkie. That's what I normally do. And then you get dressed, hopefully. And you put some clothes on. So he says, uh, verse uh, 12, uh, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Verse 14, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same old tension again, isn't it? When in Rome, we are caught, we live in here in the world, in Rome or mid Suffolk or wherever it is, but we're called to not live of the world. We're not to be of the world. No, we're God's redeemed people going to the new creation. Uh, and so we're called to live differently, distinctly, radically different. Uh, he describes uh, what we're not to do in verse 13, doesn't he? Let, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy it's back to the radical counterculture isn't it to be the exact opposite of rome or 21st century uh, britain today and you know what rome was like right this is how one person describes the debauchery in rome orgies and drinking about sexual liaisons and self-abandonment took place in the nighttime hours in roman cities hence he uses that language of day and light night and the leadership of Rome itself was notorious for debauchery. That's Rome. That's where they live. Someone uh, has said for the dominant male in ancient Rome, virtually anyone was fair game sexually uh, without regard to sex or age. Uh, someone commenting on the, the early Christian movement, they were investigating it, uh, and they said this wonderful thing. They said they have a common table, but not a common bed. The Christians were called to live distinctively in that culture. They have a common table, but not a common bed. In other words, you were safe with Christians, sexually safe. At least in theory, that Christian married people were faithful to each other, and Christian single people were celibate. And therefore, at least in theory, in the Christian community, you would be sexually safe. It was a way of protecting people. Uh, A historian has described what erupted out of the Christian movement as the first sexual revolution. Uh, The the Christian teaching in this area was, and it is absolutely radical, and in many ways has built the modern world. We're called to be radically countercultural in this area. Summer is coming. Now, uh, sin and porn and drugs, and alcohol, and lust, and many other things beside are available all year round. But there is, isn't there sometimes a particular temptation, I think, in the next few months, for all sorts of reasons, for different people, a particular temptation to cave in to these sorts of things. How will you rebel? 
through the next few months, how will you rebel in our sex-saturated culture and live distinctively for Jesus? It's interesting the three areas that he picks up on, sex, substances, and strife, the jealousy and, and dissension. How are you going to bring the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and his great love into that stuff? When in Rome, how do we live? How do we roll? How, do we, how does this all work out? Well, we have a proactive uh, political and um, public life uh, as Christians. We're to engage, uh, we're, to be, we're to submit to the authorities, we're to pray for them even as we sieve and sift what they say to us increasingly in the culture in which we live. We're to love all people for the common good, for the good of all people. And we're also called to join the radical sexual revolution, to rebel, to join the counterculture, to live for Jesus as we bring the beauty and the love of the King of Kings to our bleak and broken world. Let's pray. Father, we don't live in Rome. We do live in mid-Suffolk. And Father, we ask that you would help us to know then how to live. That we would be distinctive. That we would be different. That we would be a people marked by love. And that Father, in this generation, we would see many people drawn to the Lord Jesus through this church, and through the churches represented here today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.